get started. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ian, and welcome to everybody. And in case I forget at the end, I wish you all a very happy holiday season. Alexander Hedges needs no introduction to those who've heard him twice, but I'll go through it anyway. He has a degree from Alma College in 2014 and a PhD and master's from Michigan in 2019. He also interned at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He did a postdoc at Michigan and this fall, he began a new job as a research engineer at Stanford Research Institute in Ann Arbor. He's the grandson of past member John Kleinhetzel and his wife Sharon. And I'm very pleased to welcome Alex and everybody else to this third session of our course. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gordon. Yeah, it's like. Gordon introduced. Uh, my name is Alex, and this is part three of our seminar series. Uh, so we just went through this, so I won't repeat it, but uh, you know, yeah, I'm currently research engineer at SRI International and doing this for my grandparents, John and Sharon. Very happy to be here. Uh, so here is the list of the different topics that we've talked about in the past couple weeks. I did end up switching this week and, and last week. So now we're going to focus a bit more on the sun's radiation and space weather at Earth uh, last week with the being the focus on uh, more my research uh, in, in solar research. So here are some general top line questions that we're going to cover today. Uh, among them being, you know, what is solar radiation? What is space weather? How can it affect Earth? What can we do about it? And lastly, how do we know? Uh, so we'll be addressing these kind of throughout uh, the, the talk here, not necessarily in order, but kind of touching on each of these subjects as they come up. So for those of you who missed last week, this is the general structure of the sun uh, that I think we covered in the first week as well. Uh, so, you know, the sun is not just a light in the sky. It is a very complicated organism uh, with fusion happening at the core and that energy propagating up through the radiative zone. And then finally, hot plasma is is another zone after that where it is you know, you know circulating with hotter parts rising cooling off a bit and then sinking back down and so there's lots of these convection cells similar to what we have uh in the earth's mantle and then finally the surface of the sun which looks quite plain to us uh through just our eyes but we have seen that there's lots of stuff going on there that we can observe with different filters and looking at different wavelengths of light. Uh, and then there are also some things that are sticking out above the surface. Uh, and these are due to the magnetic structure of the sun. Uh, and these can lead to all sorts of interesting phenomena like prominences or solar flares that we're gonna talk a lot about today. Uh, and then sunspots, which are, you know, less hot spots on the surface of the sun that we can see with filters that are also due to the magnetic structure that is occurring underneath in the convective zone, kind of peaking up and affecting what's slightly above the surface. And then, of course, we have the corona, which is the sun's atmosphere that we can spy during solar eclipses, when the moon blocks out the main disk of the sun, we can see that, that atmosphere uh, just with a simple pinhole camera, but we can also see it all the time with special spacecraft. Uh, and then the solar wind, which uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this week as well, where there's just a constant outputting of low density plasma that consists mainly of charged protons and electrons with some minor ions uh, going up to carbon and iron 
in weights uh, sprinkled in there. So uh, one phenomena that is recently we learned about are called magnetic switchbacks. Uh, and we learned about this directly from Parker Solar Probe measurements. Parker Solar Probe, of course, well, not of course, but was launched uh, just three or four years ago. It's one of the most recent large space satellites that we've sent up, and it is currently uh, still orbiting the sun and getting closer and closer with each encounter. Uh, and so one of the cool things that it discovered are these magnetic switchbacks where the solar wind plasma naturally follows the magnetic field structure, the magnetic field lines that are emanating from the sun. Uh, and so we previously thought these to just be mainly straight or somewhat curved, but in reality, we've observed that there are these switchbacks, which you can see in these little lightning bolt shapes that are propagating outwards, uh, somewhat of like a magnetic kink in the line. And so we, we are still trying to come up with the theory, the theoretical framework that describes how these are formed and how they propagate outwards from the sun. Uh, and so that is just, you know, one of the little mysteries that I'm sprinkling in here. Uh, I mentioned that, you know, the, the magnetic field structure is slightly curved, and that is primarily due to differential rotation. Uh, and we've, this, this is called the, the structure here is called heliospheric current sheet. Uh, and this, this ballerina skirt, uh, as it's called, is where the polarity of the magnetic field changes. Uh, and so like Earth, the sun has a magnetic field usually or sometimes in a very neat dipole configuration with a north and south pole. Uh, and so this current sheet is where, you know, the, the south turns to north or where, you know, the midpoint of the polarity switches, uh, where the, the magnetic field is no longer going outwards from the sun, but is rather going back in towards the North Pole. Uh, and so we sometimes call this structure the Parker spiral after Eugene Parker, who theorized it in the 1950s. Uh, he also theorized the existence of the solar wind, and both of these uh, were later confirmed by spacecraft measurements. And so he is really thought to be one of the, the fathers of heliophysics with these very basic but unintuitive uh, discoveries about the structure of the sun and the heliosphere at large, which is you know the region of space that the sun dominates. Uh, and so he was actually the first living person uh, that a spacecraft was named after, Parker Solar Probe, which can launched about four years ago, uh, was named after Eugene Parker. Uh, and this structure it is thought to happen because, you know, the, the sun spins uh, not once a day, but once every about 27 days. Uh, and so the magnetic field lines that are emanating from the sun are, are kind of dragged around by this rotation. And so, you know, if you think, if you, you know, lay down a bed sheet and you put your fist in and you rotate your fist around, you'll start to see a spiral form in the folds uh, that, that are made from that rotation in the center. Uh, and so this is a similar sort of effect where you get this Archimedean spiral uh, from the magnetic field lines being dragged by that solar rotation. Uh, and, and another interesting fact is that, you know, this rotation is differential. And so it, it rotates at different speeds at different latitudes. Uh, it spins most quickly at the equator, taking about 25 days for uh, a surface feature to go all the way around back to where it started. Uh, and then it rotates slower and slower as you go up towards the poles, taking about finally 35 days at the poles to do a full rotation. Uh, and, and this averages out to around 27 days for most common sunspot features, which are uh, not quite at the equator, but are a little above or below it. Uh, and I showed this plot last week, I believe. Uh, this is a very famous plot that gives a lot of insight into the behavior and mechanics of the sun. 
uh, it's called the butterfly plot because you know you can see all these butterfly structures. And so what this is plotting is the sunspot occurrence rate uh, over time and over solar cycle. And so you can clearly see about an 11 year solar cycle here where you know things start out pretty calm and then you start to see sunspots uh, at around plus and minus 30 degrees latitude. And then over the years, they converge towards the equator uh, and, and get more and more intense kind of in the middle here. Uh, and you know this, this effect, this solar cycle has been documented since over a hundred years ago. Uh, and, and we have sunspot records going back even a bit further. Uh, and and we're, this is one of the big mysteries of, of solar science is why this 11 years uh, is showing up and, and why this seasonal difference in, in solar maximum and solar minimum. Uh, and while this is plotting sunspot number, just the number of sunspots that we see uh, over time, that is highly correlated with just solar activity in general. So the more sunspots we're seeing, the more space weather and the more extreme events we're, we're observing as well. Uh, and, and conversely, the fewer sunspots we see, the calmer uh, the space weather seems to be with, with fewer coronal mass ejections, fewer eruptions of solar energetic particles. And we're going to talk about uh, those sorts of things in detail. Let me take a sip here. Uh, but first, I'm going to show another couple visualizations of this solar cycle. Uh, so here's that same butterfly diagram uh, now plotted with average daily sunspot area as a percentage of the visible hemisphere that we can see. Uh, and so again, we have these different 11 year solar cycles, you know, not every solar cycle is the same in intensity. There is some variation between cycles. And that again, is something that we're trying to understand why uh, and uh, ideally predict how strong uh, the next solar cycle will be ahead of time. Uh, and so this is an evolving field of study, you know, and as we get more data and more measurements, uh, we can try to refine these predictions. Uh, but but as of now, it is definitely not a solved problem. Uh, here's another visualization of the solar cycle, uh, this time showing the polarity of the magnetic field uh, at each of these sunspots. Uh, and so, you know, going over time in the horizontal axis and again, latitude of the in the vertical axis. And then the color here is representing uh, in Gauss, which is a unit of magnetic field strength. And so you have plus and minus for, you know, southward and northward uh, polarities. And so you can see that with this solar cycle every 11 years, it's actually accompanied by a flipping of the magnetic field uh, from, you know, instead of the top being north, the top switches to south. And that they go back and forth every 11 years. Uh, so you can see, you know, dominantly it's yellow on top, blue on bottom for this first solar cycle, and then the reverse in the next 11 years, and then it switches back and forth and back and forth. Uh, and so we, we theorize that a similar sort of magnetic field flipping happens on Earth as well, but at a far slower rate. Uh, you know, we, we've looked at different signatures of this magnetic field in core samples uh, over long periods of history. And, and we think that this is, has happened on Earth before. Uh, so this is likely something intrinsic to uh, all bodies like the Earth or the Sun that have a magnetic core that generates a magnetic field. And there is something happening inside of it that, that generates these cycles. Again, we don't really know what, that's a very big open question that people are trying to answer. Uh, and again, one last visualization of this solar cycle over the last three solar cycles. Uh, you know, 2020 was the last solar minimum, and we are currently going upwards into the next solar max. And actually, here's that, uh, where we are in that cycle right now. And we are in solar cycle 25. Uh, which is a somewhat arbitrary numbering of, you know, when we started keeping track of this wax and wane of solar activity. Uh, and so you can see we're, you know, 
having a more active cycle than was actually predicted. Uh, the prediction was this red line. Uh, and we are set to enter, you know, the absolute peak of solar max in about two or three years. Uh, one interesting thing that happens over the solar cycle, like I said, is the magnetic field variation. And so this is a very cool plot taken at solar minimum when the magnetic structure is very calm and orderly. Uh, and so what this is showing is magnetic field uh, intensity and polarity from a orbiting spacecraft called Ulysses, uh, and in particular, a magnetic field instrument called SWOOPS uh, from Los Alamos Space and Atmospheric Sciences Lab. Uh, and so um, it's showing both the polarity of the magnetic field and, sorry, the, the the speed of the solar wind that's coming outwards. Uh, and so you can see a very clean demarcation. You know, the northern half has the outward uh, magnetic field and the southern half has the inward magnetic field. Um, but as we can see here, you know, that has changed drastically uh, over the course of an 11 year cycle. So on the left was that first orbit when it was in solar minimum. But the plots on the right now are showing what the activity and what the structure is like during solar maximum. Uh, and so you can see that there's a lot more chaotic stuff going on here, where there's not as a clean separation between the, the north and south magnetic field lines. Uh, and there's also a lot more solar jets happening with a more disordered uh, blowing out of solar wind from various places from the solar surface. Uh, and, and again, this is tied into that solar cycle where, you know, there's more sunspots, there's a more chaotic magnetic field that's emerging and causing more and more space weather events to happen. Uh, and then uh, going back for the third orbit, you can see that, you know, it's back to a more orderly magnetic field. We're back in solar minimum, but the magnetic field orientation has been flipped. So the, the inward is now, the, the magnetic field lines are now coming out of the South Pole and going into the North Pole. Well, uh, 11 years ago, it was, it was going the opposite direction. Uh, and so now I'm going to play this movie. This video clip reveals the evolution of the sun's magnetism over the course of three solar cycles. It uses data from the National Solar Observatory and from the ESA NASA SOHO satellite. We use special filters to measure the sun's magnetic field. We can peel off a map of the magnetic field as the sun rotates. New maps are obtained about every 27 days. The changes from one rotation to the next are dramatic. Magnetic fields and sunspots erupt in two bands on either side of the equator. They leave behind magnetic elements which are transported across the surface by the flowing gases. As each solar cycle progresses, these bands drift toward the equator. The magnetic elements themselves move to the right near the equator and to the left and poleward at higher latitudes. These motions reveal the equatorial jet stream and the poleward meridional flow. Yeah, so with it, within that movie, you can see, you know, the same waxing and waning of solar max and solar min with more and more sunspots. That's what those different colored uh, structures were, uh, and the yellow and blue were showing the, the inward and outward magnetic field lines. Uh, and so these sunspots are sometimes the source of uh, solar flares. And so you've probably heard of solar flare before. Um, and I'm going to talk you through kind of the standard model of how these are generated from uh, magnetic fields on the surface of the sun. And so the general idea is that, you know, over time at these sunspots, uh, there are loops of magnetic field energy that are kind of building up uh, between these sunspots, you know, going in one and so going out one and into another. Uh, and so over time, more and more magnetic field energy will build up there. Uh, but it's it's not going to be stable forever. 
And so the, the analogy that's commonly used here is, you know, imagine you have like a spring from a mechanical pencil or, or just a spring in general, and you can squeeze that more and more. But then as it's squeezed more and more, you have to be pressing downwards in exactly the up and down direction, because any misalignment in that will cause the spring to jump outwards because it's holding so much energy. Uh, any kink or, or offset of how you're holding in all that potential energy in the spring wants to erupt. And so uh, given the opportunity, it's going to fly outwards uh, if, you, if you are not constraining it perfectly. Uh, and so something very similar is happening here where there's in that buildup of magnetic energy, there is uh, at some point a what we call a magnetic reconnection where, you know, all of the magnetic field energy is building up in a particular orientation. Uh, but at some point, you know, there's enough shifting of the solar surface where that structure is no longer stable and you get magnetic field lines of opposite polarities. You know, this one's going you know, north to south, this one's going south to north. And when those opposite polarities connect, that, you know, the magnetic field wants to be in that orientation. And there's that sudden reconnection and, and a release of all that energy at once. And so with that release, you have um, lots of ejected material going outwards, as well as some of the plasma that was in those magnetic field loops going back down into the sun. Uh, and so what you call, what we call a solar flare is actually um, that material that went downwards back into the sun uh, and the emission is coming from what we call bremsstrahlung. And that is a German uh, term that translates into breaking radiation. Uh, and so, you know, due to conservation of energy, all of the mag uh, all of the charged particles in the plasma that were in the magnetic field loops are suddenly brought crashing back down uh, with all of that released magnetic field movement back into the sun. Uh, and when that plasma slams back into the surface, uh, it, it undergoes a quick decrease in speed. Uh, and due to a you know, you know, we've worked out the physics of, of how and why this happens, but the faster something is moving uh, and the faster it decelerates when it meets uh, immovable objects like the, the surface of the sun, the more high energy light it is going to be released. And that uh, conversion of kinetic energy from the motion and speed is converted into uh, high energy photons or, or X-rays. Uh, and so this is what's pictured here on the right is, is another one of those filtered images of the solar surface during a flare. Uh, and this, this is so powerful that actually it's, it's saturating the instrument that we use to make these observations where, you know, these, it's making these lens flares almost where, you know, there's no light coming from uh, this X that's coming around the flare or this, this vertical stripe. But what's happening is that there's so much energy, it's, it's leaking into other cells of the camera, uh, the CCD camera that we're using to make the image. Uh, so these things can really overwhelm the very instruments that we're using to, to observe them with. And so we have this flare classification scheme uh, where, you know, they go from A, so in increasing strength, uh, we, we can call them A, B, C, M, and X. And so each of these classes is 10 times as intense as the rest. Uh, and so you can also, um, you can also classify them with a number. So uh, C5 is five times as strong as a C1. And so an M1 would be 10 times the strength of a C1. Uh, and then for X, if you go, you can just go higher and higher. So you can 
usually for all the others, they just go up to uh, like a C9. And then a C10 is basically just an M1. Uh, but for X, which is the highest, you can go up and up into like, if, if it's stronger than an X9, you can just make an X10 or an X11. That's kind of where the scale stops. Um, and we and we measure these and characterize them with these classification schemes based on different peak fluxes or peak brightnesses in certain wavelengths of light. Uh, so this, this A with a dot over it here is called an angstrom, and it is just uh, one way of measuring the, the wavelength or the color of light. Uh, so we're, we're looking at that particular very high frequency color and seeing how brightly it, it's shining. And that is how we classify the strength of these flares. And so here's another movie of a solar storm from about 2010. And you can see these prominences that are just kind of erupting outwards. Uh, and then on the left, you're seeing these magnetic field loops uh, that are forming and, and containing the, the solar plasma that eventually uh, erupt and, and sometimes send out material called coronal mass ejections and, and also are creating flares from the reconnected uh, magnetic field lines slamming back down with that plasma into the surface. So I'll play that one more time because it's kind of short and fast. Yeah, and so the, the these, you know, the, the sun is about a hundred times as wide as Earth. So each of these structures that are flying off of the surface are way, way bigger than the entire Earth. Uh, and it can cause some pretty large effects uh, at Earth, as we'll talk about soon. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, here is just, you know, something I showed last week, which is a, a simulated recreation of a coronal mass ejection. On the right panel, you can see this mass of, of uh, magnetic fields that are moving outwards uh, that were released from the surface of the sun. And the movement of that magnetic field is actually causing a shock wave uh, from the, the plasma that it is, the plasma that it contains along the magnetic field lines. And it's just moving outwards so quickly that a shock is forming. And at that shock, even more acceleration of particles can be happening. Uh, so here is a, a nice glamour shot of a coronal mass ejection. Again, Earth is so much smaller than this, the size of the structure here. Uh, and this is when it's attached to the sun still, uh, it is sometimes called a filament. Uh, and so this is, you know, hovering in the sun's atmosphere or the corona. Uh, and this is from, I believe, a 2012 event. And it eventually erupted into a coronal mass ejection that traveled at about 900 miles a second. Uh, and fortunately, this one, it, it was a pretty monster coronal mass ejection. It did not travel directly towards Earth, uh, but it did connect with Earth's magnetic environment, also called our magnetosphere, and caused uh, a large amount of aurora to appear uh, in a few days later. Uh, after eruption in 2012. And so this is, again, uh, taken from an image, or it's actually a blended image of two different wavelengths uh, of picture taken from Solar Dynamics Observatory. And after one of these explosions, uh, or these coronal mass ejections, you can sometimes have leftover magnetic field lines that are uh, sometimes called arcades, uh, and they have plasma still running along these field lines. Uh, and what, what I mean by running along these field lines is that, you know, if you solve the complicated set of differential equations for how a plasma behaves, uh, you can, we find out that, you know, each of the charged particles in a plasma, either the protons or the electrons, uh, travel in these spiral paths along a magnetic field line. So they're kind of tied to a particular field line in the magnetic field structure. And depending on the charge of the particle, positive or negative, they, they go around in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction along that field line. 
And as they are going along, uh, you know, the, the faster they move, uh, the, the more energy the particle has, the faster it's moving, the tighter the spiral will be around that magnetic field line. Uh, and with that tighter structure and that faster, um, that the, the faster evolution and traveling of that particle along the field line, it'll give off a higher frequency light. Uh, and so this is called gyrosynchrotron radiation, where these charged particles, as they're traveling in these spirals, the spiral has that up and down characteristic to that. Um, and that oscillation actually, since these are charged particles, elicits a wave in the electromagnetic field uh, and is actually giving off light uh, in the same frequency that is that it's traveling around the, the field line in. And so this all just means that, you know, for the super fast particles, you're getting higher energy light or higher frequency light. And so this is part of where we're getting the X-rays and higher uh, radio emissions as well. Um, is this, so the Bremsstrahlung, the breaking radiation is causing the X-rays. And so that's when the higher energy particles are slamming and stopping uh, into the solar surface after this reconnection. And then kind of the, the higher frequency radio waves are caused by this gyrosynchrotron radiation where you have the, uh, you know, after an event, you can have the plasma moving along these field lines up and down out of the solar surface. Uh, and the traveling of that uh, trip creates this other radiation. So there's multiple sources of, of different colors of light uh, coming from these sorts of events. And so, yeah, I mentioned, this is a kind of cutaway of a structure of a coronal mass ejection. And so something's moving outwards, you have the, the driver, which is the actual CME itself, and that can drive a shock wave uh, that is, because it's moving so fast compared to the uh, relatively slow solar wind, uh, it's, it's making this shocked material. And so within that shock, uh, there's, it's, it's much more chaotic, um, or within, sorry, within the sheath, which is between the driver and the shock wave ahead of it. Uh, and so at the shock wave, there's probably some interesting things happening, like, uh, particle acceleration. And then in the sheath, which is again, between that driver and the shock wave, uh, you have very chaotically moving, uh, plasma structures. Uh, and along with these evolving shocks as they're moving outwards, uh, we have these solar type two and type three radio bursts that we talked about last week. Uh, and so these are very bright, the brightest things actually that we can see in the radio sky uh, from about 10 to 100 megahertz when they occur. Uh, they're brighter than actually the rest of the radio sky put together, as you can see in this um, figure here. Uh, and then in the lower right, you see the coronal radio emission. And that is exactly that gyrosynchrotron emission uh, in the post-eruption arcades that we saw a few slides back. Uh, and again, you know, the, the frequencies of these type two and type three radio bursts depend on the plasma frequency of the solar wind as they are moving outwards through the heliosphere. Uh, and so as they move outwards further from the sun, the solar wind gets less and less dense and the, the plasma frequency is proportional to that density. And so that's why we see uh, this decrease in frequency over time as these events are evolving. Uh, and so this is from a really cool paper where they actually are trying to use the radio data to estimate the speed of the shock uh, from a coronal mass ejection. And so this is some radio data here on the left that contains both a type three burst on the very left and then a complex uh, and then a type two burst uh, that is happening after it. And so, you know, the type three burst is associated with a flare, uh, which produces lots of wide band radio emission from both, you know, the, the slamming of the, the plasma back into the solar surface as well as just uh, an initial eruption of super fast electrons going outwards uh, into the heliosphere. 
Uh, but then we have this secondary type two burst, which is associated with the larger structure of the filament that is pushing its way outwards uh, from the sun into the heliosphere. Uh, and so this event goes on for over 24 hours uh, as it's pushing its way outwards um, and goes lower and lower in frequency. And since we know the formula for um, how to relate the, the density of the solar wind to the frequency that we're observing, and we have some estimates of the, the density profile, we can use uh, how quickly this is going down in frequency to try to solve for the speed. Uh, and so this is, yeah, just another image of, of uh, the eruption in question here, the coronal mass ejection. Uh, it's, it's one that is called a halo event uh, in that it is earth directed uh, because our instruments here at earth uh, see it coming outwards towards us as a halo. Uh, and so halo events are the ones that are earth directed. And there's also called limb events where they're coming off the, the side of the sun from our vantage point. And those are not going to, to hit earth. Uh, and so from this study, they were able to put together a general idea for how the coronal mass ejection speed evolves. So it starts out very fast, uh, and then as it goes outwards, it, it decreases its speed, it kind of slows down a little bit, and then finally hits a point where it uh, hits a steady state and starts cruising along at a constant speed. Uh, and so this is the speed profile that they were able to deduce uh, by, by looking at this radio emission and measuring how quickly it goes down in relation to our solar wind density models. Uh, and, it, and in order to do this, we had to use a multitude of different instruments. Uh, so I'm gonna take a moment to describe those now. Uh, on the left are what we call coronagraphs. And this is basically recreating a lunar eclipse, uh, sorry, a solar eclipse all the time. So we have a satellite out there that has a, uh, a piece that blocks out the sun uh, from its camera so that it is only seeing the atmosphere of the sun. Uh, and so we can, with this coronagraph, see the density of plasma electrons in particular, but it's, it's representative of plasma in general, of, of the plasma coming off the sun uh, in a certain range. Uh, and then another antenna we use is, uh, sorry, another instrument we use is of course the radio antenna that allows us to do remote sensing of the radio waves that are coming off. Uh, and then one more instrument we used is called a Faraday cup. And this is a really cool instrument that uses a combination of charged plates to allow in and measure uh, protons and electrons that are coming in. So think of this like a bucket uh, that we have attached to a satellite. And the bucket has some uh, sensors at the bottom of the bucket that allows it to, to tell what the density is of incoming uh, plasma as well as its speed and energy distribution. And so we used, th this study used the Faraday cup to determine when exactly the, the coronal mass ejection arrived at Earth. Uh, and from that, it was able to uh, deduce the speed of which it, it took or, or the time it took for the coronal mass ejection to erupt and then make its way to Earth. Uh, so we were able to see when it started with the coronagraph, we were able to sense how it evolved in the meantime with the remote sensing of the radio waves. And then we were able to see when it arrived with the Faraday cup. And so by combining all of these different pieces with these different instruments, when it started, how it evolved, when it arrived, uh, that was able to allow us to deduce this velocity profile. Uh, so, you know, it takes a lot of different instruments to build up a complete picture of some of these space weather events. Uh, other, other instruments that can be used to further fill out that picture are magnetometers, 
which allow you to measure the actual you know strength of the magnetic field associated with uh the plasma coming in uh so you, this would also allow you to see uh when the event arrived at earth it would be accompanied by a much stronger magnetic field associated with the shock uh, and then an electrostatic analyzer is another instrument uh similar to a faraday cup where instead of a bucket with charged plates that let in and measure uh, the plasma. This has sort of a curved uh, structure to the plates, uh, and this allows it to analyze not just protons, but also heavier elements in the solar wind, like carbon and iron, uh, which have their own mass to charge ratio. Uh, and so depending on that mass to charge ratio, uh, it will either and also its speed, uh, it will either crash into one of these plates or or get sucked into another plate. And so what an electrostatic analyzer does is it only allows a certain window of particles in energy and charge to mass to actually make it all the way through these curved uh, charged plates, one positive, one negative. Uh, and those that make it through are finally uh, slam into the detector. And so that allows us to measure the density of different species of ions, not just protons, but, but, but different elements as well. Uh, and so here's a nice little schematic showing the, the overall structure of a coronal mass ejection. So, you know, the flare is happening at the surface uh, where the stuff is slamming back into the sun. The coronal mass ejection is what is released and is moving outwards from the sun. Uh, and that, if it's moving fast enough, can create a shock wave that will uh, make even more energetic protons and electrons that can even run ahead of the shock moving outwards. Uh, and so, again, I think I mentioned this last week, but uh, it's it's really the the particles that are energized by the shock as it's moving outwards uh, that are the most high energy and most danger to uh, to astronauts, say. Uh, and then we will be talking about very soon what happens when a powerful coronal mass ejection arrives at Earth and the effects it can have on, on our system here. And so we'll be diving into that right now. So how does the Earth system, how does, how is our atmosphere, our magnetosphere, how is the surface, how are these, all of these things affected uh, by these different events or these different phenomena uh, emerging and originating from the sun. And so here's a zoomed in graphic of the structure of the earth at this scale. Uh, and so the most important thing here is the earth's magnetosphere. Uh, and so, you know, we, we all know that the earth has a north and south pole it has magnetic field lines going out of the south into the north, uh, and that structure creates a dipole, uh, which is you know an idealized pattern of how the different field lines are evolving, going in and out of the different poles. Um, but the the Earth is not in a vacuum. Uh, I mean, space is is nearly a vacuum, but. Uh, the most important driver that affects this magnetosphere is the solar wind and any incoming space weather. Uh, and so even in normal times, the, the Earth's magnetic field is affected by the solar wind that's coming at it. Uh, and so, you know, you have a, you know, without the magnetosphere of Earth, life would be very different or maybe not even possible uh, because it, does a lot of work in shielding us from the harmful effects of the solar wind and other space weather. Uh, it, it does a lot of deflection of solar wind uh, and it kind of shields us from the magnetic impact of the solar wind. Uh, and so some different structure I wanna call out here is the magneto tail. Uh, so the, the movement of that solar wind is kind of dragging the field lines back uh, away from its idealized dipole structure uh, and, and creating this, these long uh, 
long magnetic field lines that are arching outwards behind the Earth from the sun. Oops. Uh, and so eventually those magnetic field lines go for, far back enough that the pressure of the solar wind allows them to reconnect. And then so those, those magnetic field lines go through some process of being peeled back, reconnecting far behind, and then making their way back as connected field lines. And so that is exactly what is happening in this uh, back portion here. And that is associated again with a plasma sheet, uh, a, a current sheet similar to the ones that the sun has. Uh, and another structure I wanna call out here is, you know, there, there's a spot where the strength of the magnetic field, you know, the, the just ahead of the earth, the, the magnetic field strength is strong enough that it is not peeled back. Uh, but then as you move up toward up in latitude, uh, it becomes weak enough that it is started to peel back. And so where that unpeeled and peeled portion of the magnetic field meets, uh, there is this cone that allows incoming solar wind and energetic particles to precipitate down into Earth. Uh, and so these are, as, as we'll see soon, what causes aurora. Uh, to happen at the north and south poles, polar regions. Uh, it, there's this ring structure around the Earth that brings in, uh, that, that allows these particles to funnel in from the solar wind into the Earth system near the surface. Um, and again, all of this magnetic field structure is, is happening far above what we think of as the normal atmosphere of Earth. Uh, the Earth's atmosphere only goes up about 100 kilometers from the surface, and the, the width of the Earth is about 10,000 kilometers. Um, so, and, and as you can see, this magnetic field structure goes up far above all of that. And um, so, so moving on, uh, one, one other thing that isn't super relevant, but is, is fun to call out, uh, is that we have radiation belts above Earth. And these are collections or, or belts of energetic particles uh, that are trapped around Earth uh, and that we think are seeded by this solar wind uh, and the incoming particles. Uh, and so the inner belt in red is dominated by protons and the outer one in blue uh, is, is dominated by electrons. Uh, and this is a steady state phenomena. These are nearly always there. And we have to take them into account when we're planning the orbits of satellites. Uh, because if a satellite is, is launched and is staying within these, these belts, uh, they receive a much higher dose of radiation than something above or below the belts, uh, which decreases the lifetime of those satellites. Uh, so things in low Earth orbit, like the ISS or, or much of our other satellites, uh, are, are below these radiation belts. Uh, but once you move further outwards, uh, you have to plan your orbits accordingly to avoid or minimize the time spent in these belts to, for the health of your spacecraft. Um, yeah, here's, here's another schematic of that solar wind magnetosphere interaction uh, where you see the magneto tail trailing off behind the earth and these peeled off magnetic field lines from the pressure and magnetic field of the solar wind being driven back and then reconnecting and coming back inwards uh, bringing along with it some of the plasma. Uh, and so we're going to talk a bit about some of the effects of uh, this space weather and the solar wind coming in. I'm gonna take a quick sip of coffee here. So we're gonna talk a bit about aurora, uh, how these are caused by the energetic particles coming in. And then we're gonna talk about some of the adverse effects that can happen from the more extreme events. Uh, and among these, we're gonna talk about the effects that could happen to our electrical grids uh, and the, the GPS systems that can be affected by 
ionospheric density changes, uh, and then as well as effects on high frequency radio communications that occur between one and 30 megahertz, uh, as well as communications with satellites, and as well as drag that can be induced by major space weather events uh, and the swelling of the atmosphere that can affect and change the orbits of satellites. Okay, so Aurora, you know, we all know about this very beautiful, this is like the, the most benign uh, and beautiful of the effects that we can have, that we can see uh, from the effects of space weather. And so these are caused by the arrival of solar energetic particles that usually are coming down through this cusp, this little opening near, uh, near the poles that are allowing in energetic particles. And those energetic particles uh, then can ionize the gases in our atmosphere. Uh, and that energization and ionization of the gases can give off colors of uh, varying wavelengths and colors and complexity. Uh, and this happens near that polar cusp and the polar latitudes normally, uh, but very intense space weather can, can make these aurora visible uh, and at, at lower and lower latitudes. Uh, so the most intense space weather events can cause uh, aurora to be visible here in Michigan or even down in Hawaii in the most extreme uh, cases. And so yeah, here is a movie uh, taken from the ISS orbiting over Southern Australia uh, in the Southern Hemisphere uh, at, at the very high Southern latitudes uh, showcasing widespread aurora as it, as it evolves. Really cool stuff. And so yeah, this is again kind of constrained to the, the atmosphere itself, which is again, a very thin layer over the surface of the sun compared to the rest of the magnetosphere. So we'll, we'll watch that one more time. Oops. Yeah, really beautiful stuff. I unfortunately have not had the, the chance to see these in person, but I do hope to, to take a trip with my wife at some point, perhaps to Northern Canada or Iceland, uh, where you can commonly see these, uh, particularly in solar max, they are more common because of the higher influx of energetic particles. Uh, and so this is a, this is a, another visualization of Aurora. Uh, this is called a keogram uh, used to plot the, the structure of Aurora over time. Uh, and on the left here, we have just a, a still image of a global aurora structure at the South Pole. Uh, and so these can really be very large uh, and, and widespread over the whole polar regions. Okay. Uh, and so this plot here is meant to show the extent of different communications uh, between satellites as well as ground stations. Uh, and so what's, what's really cool and what you might not know is that we commonly use the fact that we have an ionosphere, uh, a, a layer of charged particles, uh, and, that, and these charged particles, again, interact with very low frequency waves. And it's common practice, actually, to use this ionosphere to reflect communication waves off so that we can communicate uh, with places that are usually beyond the reach of traditional linear uh, approaches to communicate. And so by reflecting, as you can see in these yellow lines, uh, by reflecting communication waves off of the ionosphere, we're able to communicate much further distances uh, than we would otherwise due to the curvature of the Earth, kind of limiting how far over the horizon can we get actual line of sight uh, connections between different antennas. Uh, and so these are typically the HF uh, frequencies between one and 30 megahertz that are used uh, that are, are relatively low frequency uh, compared to other uh, communication waves. And so 
these can be disturbed uh, by intense space weather events that, that can cause the ionosphere to act differently or to swell. Uh, and the, the very precise angle or the very precise kind of pool or billiard shot bounces off of those, um, off of that layer of charged particles that we rely on uh, can, can be affected and be changed unpredictably by, by incoming space weather events. And so that can disrupt uh, this, these communications uh, in the low frequency waves. Um, those incoming space weather particles can also, you know, as I said, swell and affect the ionosphere and can disturb the time it takes for a GPS signal to come down from a satellite onto a receiver in your car or, or plane. Uh, and so the way GPS works is that, you know, we have to measure very precisely the time it takes uh, for a signal to come from different satellites that have very precise clocks. Uh, and so by looking at the signals coming from three or more GPS satellites, we triangulate our position very precisely on the earth. Uh, but that requires us to know the time it takes for that signal to propagate from the GPS satellite to our receiver in our car. Uh, and that precise timing knowledge can be thrown off when the ionosphere is, is changed uh, by incoming space weather. Uh, and so this can really throw off our positional awareness of anything that's using GPS uh, when that ionospheric layer is disturbed by space weather. Um, and similarly, it can, it can uh, block out or, or add noise to any communications we're trying to have with satellites above the ionosphere. Uh, and so another big effect that we have to keep in mind are what we call geomagnetically induced currents. Uh, and this is where when a coronal mass ejection arrives at Earth with its own very strong magnetic field uh, that can cause oscillations all the way down to the surface. Uh, and, and if you go back to high school physics class, uh, Faraday's law says that a uh, oscillating magnetic field can produce a current, an electrical current. Uh, and if this happens in the wrong place, it can really, it can really screw over the uh, electrical grid. Uh, and so these days, if, if a really major space weather event were to occur, it could uh, result in large scale power outages due to uh, unpredicted currents overloading electrical transformers, uh, as well as causing disruption or blackouts of radio communications, including GPS. Um, these GIC currents can also damage uh, submarine communication cables uh, that are used to you know, transmit internet data from one continent to another through these giant undersea networks of, of, of cables. Um, and the, the particles themselves uh, of the energetic plasma can also penetrate the shielding of satellites and spacecraft and even uh, uh, you know, vehicles like the ISS containing humans uh, and damage or, or even destroy uh, the electronic circuit boards that they use to uh, function. And so when this space weather happens, uh, it, it can also just be hazardous to human health. And so if you're flying over the poles uh, when this happens, you're likely to get a larger dose of radiation. Uh, and so if, if you're in a space, you know, if you're in a rocket ship going to the moon, for example, and you're leaving the, the protective shield of Earth's magnetosphere and atmosphere, if a major space weather event were to happen, uh, you could actually get radiation sickness from all the damage that these very small atomic particles and X-rays uh, can do to your DNA, uh, similar to those that, you know, happened at people around Hiroshima or, or other atomic eruptions. 
Uh, and so, yeah, a, another effect that I already mentioned once is satellite drag. And so this is where the swelling of the atmosphere or the from incoming space weather uh, can affect the density profile of the of the atmosphere so that, you know, it, things that are usually very sparse and very uh, almost vacuum like can suddenly get an influx of more dense gas and that will affect the orbit of the satellite. And so you can see the different paths of a satellite orbit with no drag, which is what it usually does, and then satellite with drag, where we'll actually bring down the altitude of the satellites uh, and, and affect, you know, and affect where it goes. And so this alongside radio blackouts, where the, the ionosphere can disrupt communications with the satellites, can really throw off our awareness and make us lose track of where they're going. Uh, because, you know, there's the effect of, you know, first off, there's, we expect the satellite to evolve a certain way in normal times, and that is thrown off uh, by the swelling of the atmosphere with the increased drag. Uh, and then that on top of us losing communications with it can cause us to sometimes actually lose satellites uh, and we have to then scan the sky after the event is over to try to relocate it and then get a fix on what its new orbital trajectory is. Uh, and so that is an exercise that we, we sometimes have to do with these space weather events. Um, one major, so now I'm going to talk about some historical space weather events, uh, both in historical times and also more recently, and, and the worst case scenario of, of what these can do to us. Uh, and so very classic in these sorts of talks is to talk about the Carrington event, uh, which happened in um, 1856, I believe. Uh, and so this was famously recorded by Richard Carrington, who was an English astronomer, uh, who he, he had a habit of tracking the, the sunspots uh, on the sun with his own sort of uh, filtered map that, that he made, you know, every day. He just uh, had this projection instrument that projected on, projected down the surface of the sun onto a big table. And then on that table, he laid down some paper and was able to trace out the structure of the uh, sunspots with pen or pencil. And so he did that every day. And he just so happened to do it on the day of a major space weather event. Uh, and so we named this event after him because he's the one who uh, did the recording of the sunspots that caused it. Uh, and so this event was the most intense event in, in recorded history uh, that we have good data for. And so it was so intense and, and also, you know, technology had advanced to a spot that it was affected by these geomagnetically induced currents. Uh, and these GICs caused telegraph machines all over the world to shock their operators and catch fire uh, due to the intensity of the currents that were generated on the surface. Uh, and again, aurora were, were so intense and they were visible in areas that almost never saw them. Uh, so they were able to make their way as south as Hawaii and other tropical areas. Uh, and this really solidified uh, humanity's understanding of the connection of solar flares and geomagnetic disturbances. You know, we, we had seen aurora before, we had, you know, been looking at sunspots for a while now, but really this was kind of the kicker uh, in, in giving us that connection to you know, observing big flares and big structures on the solar surface and understanding that, oh, these can actually have major effects here at Earth. Um, yeah, and so, so observing the solar storms ahead of time can give us some sort of warning uh, as to uh, when the actual event arrives two or three days later. Um, it can, it, it gives us that warning signal uh, by looking at the surface and then trying to understand uh, if it arrives at Earth, 
the sorts of effects it can have. Uh, so some other historical space weather events of note, you know, one before the Carrington event in 1906, uh, Alexander von Humboldt observed that his compass uh, became erratic during the bright auroral event. And so he was kind of the another first person to observe that, you know, compasses and magnetic fields get all screwy uh, when, when bright aurora are present. Uh, and then after the Carrington event in 1882, uh, there was another major space weather event that caused the switchboard at the Chicago Western Union uh, to get set on fire several times. Um, and other observations associated with this event from you know, Milwaukee to Wyoming to Minnesota, everyone saw hugely bright aurora that were you know, as bright as daylight and a blood red sky. Uh, and so, and, and other things that people observed was that these geomagnetically induced, geomagnetically induced currents, these GICs, were able to uh, make light bulbs glow. Uh, and so this, this is the quote from Milwaukee, that the, the GIC was able to light up a lamp that was turned off, uh, just to give you an idea of what these things can actually do and how they interact with technology. Um, and we also, by analyzing ice cores and, and other core samples, uh, we can see that these sorts of major space weather events have been happening for hundreds and thousands of years uh, by looking at nitrate-rich layers within the core samples. Uh, and we think this is because that the solar energetic particles from space weather events ionize the nitrogen in our atmosphere, uh, and that can leave a footprint in these in these ice samples uh, from historical records. Uh, and some more recent space weather events in the past 50 years or so, uh, there was a G5 level solar storm, we'll talk about the, the classification system soon, uh, in 1972. And this caused accidental detonation of hundreds or thousands of US naval mines in North Vietnam uh, during the war there. Uh, so and also caused the, the solar panels on early spacecraft to be degraded by about 5% in efficiency, uh, which is equivalent to about two years worth of wear. Uh, and, and so these early, this along with like, you know, the next 18, 1989 geomagnetic storm really told the US government that, you know, it's important to understand these phenomena and if possible, predict them because, you know, something that has the ability to accidentally explode mines or shut down communications uh, is, is really important for both, you know, tactical awareness and just civilization at large. Uh, and so another famous event in 1989 caused a nine hour outage uh, in Quebec for their entire electrical grid uh, and also caused computer crashes uh, all across the Toronto Stock Exchange that caused it to halt trading. Uh, and so this was just a, you know, relatively major event, but nowhere near the scale of a Carrington scale event. Uh, so things would have been even worse if, if we had a larger event that, that struck us there. Uh, and then even mo most recently, uh, in February of this year, SpaceX uh, was launching their Starlink satellites, which are, you know, they're launching lots of satellites these days to provide internet to remote areas uh, via the satellite connections. Uh, and a mild solar, well, quote unquote, mild, was, you know, moderate or so, solar particle and geomagnetic storm led to the failure and re-entry of 40 recently launched satellites uh, that were in low Earth orbit. And it was exactly because of this satellite drag that was induced by the swelling of the atmosphere from that, um, from the, the incoming space weather that, that caused that drag. And so even nowadays, we're, we're, we have to learn uh, that, you know, there can be really large effects uh, by even the modestly sized space weather events that we have to take into account uh, for, for our modern technology. And so, yeah, the worst case scenario for, for a sort of event like the Carrington scale, if it were to happen today, uh, it would be pretty bad. 
because you know these days we're much more reliant on electricity. Uh, and if the grid were to go down across the whole world, uh, lots of stuff would happen, lots of bad stuff. Uh, and so there was a recent study in the in the past few years done by the Atmospheric and Environmental Research Institute that says a modern Carrington event would cost the U.S. alone six hundred seventy billion to three trillion dollars in twenty twenty dollars uh, a year. And so that's roughly you know three to fifteen percent of annual GDP. Uh, and and a big piece of that is that if large electrical transformers were caught unaware, the, the GIC currents could ruin them uh, and break them. And the those sorts of infrastructure pieces are, are very slow to replace. Uh, you know, if, if all of them broke at once, it would take a lot of effort to replace them. Um, and so it's best to be prepared. Um, but fortunately, you know, if we have good knowledge of incoming space weather events, it is possible to just turn off the grid for a few hours or so uh, and disconnect all of these large transformers ahead of time, and that could save the equipment. And so this is really great motivator for, for doing space weather prediction, which there is a lot of effort going into by you know NASA and the government at large. So uh, these are a few panels from the Space Weather Prediction Center uh, here at the, at the United States. This is just pulled from a dashboard, which I will I'll go to after the slides. Uh, on the left here is a uh, similar to what I showed earlier is a uh, magnetohydrodynamic simulation of the Sun and Earth's uh, of of the heliosphere, including the Sun and the Earth. Uh, and so this shows the solar winds density, as well as the magnetic field strength, uh, and can show the evolution of any major space weather events and predict their, their effects here at Earth. Uh, and so you can see these, this spiral structure uh, is exactly that, that Parker spiral that occurs from the magnetic field lines uh, being rotated while well, well, being affected by the sun's rotation. Uh, so the sun's rotation gives rise to this global magnetic field structure along which uh, streams of higher density solar winds can escape. Uh, and that global structure can be affected by the very largest space weather events that have their own huge magnetic field and can create a shock wave as they move outwards. Um, on the right, you can also see a aurora forecast uh, which is another one of these standard products that is generated constantly from the all of the data that we have coming in from our various satellites. Uh, and that can show you the probability of aurora uh, over the over the near term future. Uh, and so I think I took this from yesterday or today. Uh, and so we are not forecasting any huge space weather events uh, in the super near future. And the aurora will be uh, constrained to the very highest latitudes for that reason. Uh, and so, to talk about flare classification um, and and the classification of a a solar storm or geomagnetic storm happening at Earth, um, again, that so the top panel here uh, is is a repeat of what we saw before of how we classify the flares. Uh, and that is directly linked to the brightness in, in X-rays of, of uh, what we can see at the surface of the sun. Uh, and then on the bottom, we see another table that shows the classification of the storm uh, or the geomagnetic event, uh, R1 through R5. And so these are associated with the very highest energy flares, the M and X flares. Uh, and they go along with you know, varying levels of radio blackout. Uh, from minor to moderate to strong, severe, extreme. Um, so understanding and predicting these is, is really important for modern infrastructure. Uh, and so this is a little bit more in depth of a table uh, describing the various impacts of these G1 through G5 events. 
Uh, and the, the very right-hand column, I'm sorry, this is a bit small, but I, I'm not going to read every word, but the very right-hand column shows the number of days during the last solar cycle, solar cycle, solar cycle 24, uh, that had this classification. Uh, and so remember, a solar cycle is 11 years, so roughly uh, almost 4,000 days. Uh, and so for G1, we had a G... We had that scale of, of event happen 256 out of that 256 days during that 11 year solar cycle. Uh, and so as you go up in intensity, uh, these events become more and more rare. Uh, and so you can see that in the last solar cycle, we did not have a single G5 storm, um, but the average frequency is, is four per cycle. Uh, but we kind of got lucky last cycle, but but we do expect them to happen every so often. And the Carrington class event would be like an, 10 times more powerful than uh, anything we've seen in, in recent history. So understanding and predicting when they would happen, uh, again, is very key. Uh, so I'm gonna play uh, another movie. This is about two minutes long of how we can do these simulations. In this visualization, Earth's magnetic field structure is represented by lines that correspond to the paths charged particles would travel close to the Earth. The Sun's magnetic field, carried in the plasma of the solar wind, flows continuously by the Earth, distorting the planet's field and pulling it back into a windsock-type structure. The red illustrates the higher density plasma which forms the magnetopause, the boundary between the magnetic influence of the sun and the earth. The wind also forms a lower density magnetotail behind the earth, represented by blue in this computer model. This process is happening all the time as the solar wind is constantly flowing by the earth. But a coronal mass ejection, or CME, can change things. The higher density plasma and stronger magnetic field carried within the CME strikes Earth's field and significantly alters the structure. Here we see the dramatic changes in Earth's magnetic field and the shape of the magnetopause as the CME passes Earth. But close to Earth, the magnetic field is largely unchanged. Earth is protected from the intense solar event. This is the case for a rather ordinary CME. In this example, a CME launched by an X3 flare from December 2006. But what would happen in the case of a more intense event, such as the Carrington event of 1859? With the aid of similar computer models as before, we can explore some of these possibilities. Here, a much stronger CME compresses the magnetic field between the Sun and Earth and generates more density in the bow shock, represented by darker red. The front of the magnetopause is pushed much closer to the Earth than usual. Even the field and plasma trailing behind the Earth are more strongly distorted. Yeah, so we are working every year to better the models uh, and increase the accuracy of them so that we can have a good warning time of, of when such events would occur. Uh, but it is a very hard problem, and we've not stumbled upon a perfect solution yet. Uh, the best we have are these global scale, um, global scale magnetohydrodynamic hydro models that, uh, with enough computing power, can run faster than real time so that it can take in measurements from the solar surface uh, and predict what the evolution of different space weather events could be. Uh, and if we run them fast enough, we could see that the outputs, what the output simulation would be at the Earth before it actually happens. And, um, you know, with enough warning time, we could definitely save a lot of the electric grid and save ourselves from uh, the most harmful effects. Uh, and so I'm gonna spend the last few minutes here uh, pulling it back to Sunrise, which is uh, my work, which is a mission that attempts to understand using the radio data associated with these different space weather events, uh, how the energiz energization 
of the particles occurs. Uh, and sunrise, again, won't be a real time sort of warning system, but is meant to lay the groundwork for such a system and answer basic physics questions on where within a large CME uh, the acceleration is happening. And so uh, this two degree circle is basically the best uh, localization we have today from a single spacecraft of where the uh, radio waves are coming from within a space weather event. And then the colored circles more on the right are showing the capabilities of sunrise when it launches in a, in a couple of years. Uh, and so it'll help distinguish between these competing hypotheses of how that particle acceleration happens uh, as the CME evolves outward between the, the shock, the, the shock flank, reconnection behind the CME, and turbulence throughout the CME. Uh, and so Sunrise will have six satellites that are in geo orbit. Uh, and by combining the measurements from these six satellites, we can make rudimentary images uh, and localize where the radio is coming from over frequency. And so on the left is a uh, simulated output from that uh, science pipeline that, that I programmed over the last few years, uh, where the bottom is the radio brightness that we were we are able to get with just a single spacecraft uh, that we've seen before. And then on top is the coronagraph images combined with the, the localizations of where the radio emission is coming from uh, using sunrise recreations. Uh, and again, here on, is another example of the modeling that we can do to understand how a uh, big space weather event evolves over time. And so this is showing the uh, shock wave of an event as it evolves outward and the radio frequency that we predict it would emit at. Uh, and so we can compare the actual radio data that we recorded on the upper right with the predicted radio emission uh, from this recreated simulation of that event on the, the bottom. Uh, and so that can tell us you know, about how close we are uh, with our simulation to understanding the overall structure of the, of the shock wave evolving. Uh, and so then when we look at the shock wave, we can also zoom in in the simulation and look at what particular uh, plasma parameters uh, are, are correlated or are meaningfully linked to uh, where the emission is coming from. And so this is from a study that I did uh, looking at that recreated simulation of a, of a shock wave uh, and finding that this plasma parameter called de Hoffman teller velocity, uh, which is linked to the, the specific orientation of the magnetic field within the shock uh, and some other plasma parameters uh, and how that seems very linked to where the emission is going to be coming from. So sunrise observations will be able to confirm uh, this link of where the radio emission is coming from within a CME shock uh, by actually imaging where the emission is coming from. Uh, and then by combining that with coronagraph data, we'll be able to see exactly where within the structure uh, that emission is. Uh, and so I'm going to wrap up here, uh, but the last thought I want you to have is that, you know, the scientific community, NASA, uh, European Space Agency, ESA, uh, everyone over the whole world has a vested interest in trying to understand the sun and space weather. Uh, and so we have, for, for decades now, been sending out spacecraft to take these ever more detailed measurements to uh, build up our understanding of the universe. And uh, I'm very happy to have played some part in that. And I, I hope that you've all learned something and uh, can appreciate uh, the, the threat and interesting beauty that space weather uh, gives us here on Earth. So uh, thank you all for having me these past three weeks. I've had a really good time uh, sharing all of this with you. And I, I hope you enjoyed it as well. So I will now take any questions you have and thank you for your time.
Thank you, Alex. We appreciate your time uh, and your presentations over the last three weeks. We do have some questions in the chat that I'd like to relay to you. Uh, the first coming from Rob. Has the accuracy of more intense space weather events been reviewed against the actual impact they possess? If so, is it better than our typical Earth weather forecasts? Yeah, it's it's an evolving science, uh, and I think that that Earth weather in general is much better right now because we have so much more data. Uh, you know, we have weather satellites all over the place, both in orbits and on the ground, uh, and that gives us basically more data points that we can plug into our model and to assimilate so that we can run the clock forward and see what happens. Um, I think, you know, so theoretically, also the, the Earth climate system or the, or the weather system is simpler because there's not this element of electromagnetism. Uh, space weather is dealing with plasmas, which are, are basically fluids or gases that, that act a certain way, but then also are influenced by uh, magnetism and electricity. And so they have, they're just more complicated to model. Um, gases in the atmosphere of Earth are not charged. They are, you know, the electrons and protons are bound together in atoms. Uh, and so they have more simple, still very complex equations that, that govern their behavior. Um, so, you know, one, the dynamics are a bit more simple of how these things evolve, the gases uh, with, with temperature and pressure and all that. Uh, and two, there's more data that we have to feed into the model. So those two facts lead to, you know, a better understanding and a better prediction rate of earth weather uh, as opposed to space weather. Thank you. Uh, and I'm gonna, gonna remind everyone, if you have a question for Alex, please place it in the chat window or type it in the chat window or come off mute and let us know that you're interested in a question. Alex, in the meantime, um, I'm curious, where does the prime, what is the primary source of funding for this research? Is it individually based per institution where it's being conducted? Are you receiving federal grant money from somewhere or uh, what's your primary source? Yeah, so actually let me, so the, the answer to that is that NASA provides lots of opportunities for grants uh, to answer particular questions. Um, so, so here, so I'm actually going to go to a, uh, centralized funding source for, for NASA. And so this is a table it's called ROSES, which stands for Research Opportunities in Earth and Space Sciences. And so NASA releases this every year, uh, and all of these lines are different grant opportunities that people and scientists apply to uh, from all over industry and, and academia uh, and different universities. They apply for these different grants, which pose various open questions that uh, they want answered. And so scientists uh, write up applications for these grants and then committees review all the applications and choose some subset of them uh, to give a bucket of money or some funding to, uh, to do some work on the, the problems. And so Sunrise is a NASA funded mission, uh, particularly through the heliophysics division. So there's, you know, there's earth science, heliophysics, astrophysics, uh, and they all have their different budget allocations, and those are all split into various grant opportunities that, that people apply for. Thank you. Uh, John Kleinhexel, I see that you are on camera. Would you like to make a comment? If so, you can unmute yourself. Otherwise, you can give me a thumbs down and I'll move on to the next person. Well, I want to say uh, thank you to Alex. Oh, we're proud of you, Alex. And uh, just a lot of it uh, is way over my head, but I know that the payoff uh, could be very great for electric uh, grids uh, globally. And uh, best wishes on your ongoing research with Sunrise and, and going beyond. Thank you very much for the last three weeks. Proud of you. Thanks so much, Grandpa. 
Thanks, John. I'm now going to go to Louis Morel, who has a question. Louis, feel free to come off mute and share your question with Alex. Good morning, Alex. Uh, thank you very much for these presentations. It's a uh, humbling reminder of how small we are in the vastness of space. It's actually mind boggling. Having said that, I don't know if anybody in the audience or yourself remember that about 16 months ago, the Postal Service issued some postage stamps on solar science. And this might remind you of what it was. It issued 12 images. This sheet contains 24 stamps and they were all obtained from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which was launched a dozen years ago or so. And they represent 12 different features, characteristics of the sun. And I do not know um, how many people were, whose, their curiosity was piqued by this. Uh, it showed, and it showed uh, solar flares, it showed plasma blasts, uh, coronal holes. But can you tell us a little bit more about the origin of these images? These are composites, I suspect. Um, how, how does the SDO obtain this? Yeah, so I, I do remember those stamps. I think I, I have a sheet somewhere saved in a drawer. Uh, and so yes, SDO, Solar Dynamics Observatory, is a satellite that is parked at what we call the first Lagrange point. And so this is a, a gravitationally stable point where the gravity from the sun is equal to the gravity of the earth. And so you can just park your spacecraft there and you don't have to spend any, uh, you don't have to do any propulsion or spend any fuel to, to stay stationary. And it's also nice because you're constantly can just point at the sun and look at it. You're not orbiting around the earth. You're just stuck at this gravitationally neutral point. So we have a lot of different spacecraft there. SDO uh, is one of them. And so SDO has many different filters uh, that it takes pictures through to look at the sun. And each of these filters is focused at a particular color of light or a particular frequency. Uh, and these frequencies are chosen very carefully uh, because we know that they are spectral lines associated with different uh, ions or different processes within the sun. And so each of these images I'm showing here are the different filters uh, and the, the, the numbers here are indicative of what color we're looking at. And so uh, some of these colors are, you know, composite, like this one is a combination of three different filters put together. Uh, and, and they showcase different features of the solar surface. Uh, and, and some things are better than others at showing uh, different features on the sun. Uh, for instance, yeah, I, yeah, so like, uh, these are all in like the ultraviolet spectrum. Uh, above the optical wavelengths. And so it's showing, you know, higher energy light that, that doesn't make it down to the, to the surface of the sun. So we have to go up into space to see it. Um, and yeah, just these, these different spectral lines that we look at to, to see the different features on the solar surface. Um, I, I, yeah, that's, that's about all I can say to it. Uh, Where might I find this information that you're showing us right now? Yep, this is the, the SDO website. So if you just Google SDO or, or search for SDO, it should be one of the first things to pop up. Uh, this is a NASA website that shows the very latest data. Uh, and if you, this is the homepage, and if you click on more images, uh, it'll bring you to, to that other tab right here. Uh, and so, yeah, this is very nice because it, yeah, it just steps through all of the different filters it has. Uh, to show you all the activity. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, only sad part, of course, about the stamps is that they don't explain anything. They just show an, an image of some feature, but doesn't explain. However, perhaps some people who purchased the stamps actually went out and dug into it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Louis. 
Well, I don't see any additional questions in the chat window and no one else has come off mute to indicate uh, questions. So I will turn things over uh, to Gordon, but I believe, uh, I think he just maybe uh, fell out by mistake. Uh, so I will say thank you to Alex for joining us again for the last three weeks. And thank you all for joining us uh, for uh, this uh, uh, course as well. If uh, you have any additional comments or questions for Alex, please send those to the HASP office. We will be happy to relay them to him. And you should have an email in your account right now that is an evaluation. So you can complete that and we can share those that feedback with Alex uh, and hopefully bring him back if you're interested in additional courses from him. So thank you all and wish you a happy holiday. Uh, the HASP office, again, as a reminder, is open until December 15th. And we are closed December 16th through January 2nd. So we'll see you all in the new year if we don't see you before then. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Alex, we'll stay in contact via email as we close out some of these final pieces. Sounds good. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, take care. You too.